Suda51. How do I even properly introduce the man? I think saying his work is just unique wouldn't really be covering the whole spectrum. As the founder of Grasshopper Manufacturer, he and his team have made probably some of the most interesting and niche games for each of their respective consoles, both experimenting heavily in gameplay and narrative. You probably know him best for No More Heroes. Lots of people really got pulled into that series just because of the style, the attitude, the humor, all bursting with amazing personality and I've never played the game. Yeah, I've never really played a Suda game ever, but believe me, I've always had some kind of interest for at least his lesser known stuff. And I think that interest really sparked when I first heard of a game called Killer7. It's probably Goichi Suda's second most well-known game he's made, and for very good reason. It has a wicked cool art style which delivers a creepy stylish atmosphere, gameplay mechanics so unconventional from anything you've seen, and a surprisingly deeply profound narrative? What? Man, Killer7 seems to be that other Suda51 game that gets constant praise, and it's really interesting because at launch, it was honestly destined to be forgotten. Everything I just mentioned probably drove lots of people away at the time, and the people who did actually try it out, they had mixed impressions. Killer7 was also part of the Capcom 5 fun fact, which even had Resident Evil 4. These were five games that Capcom promised to release exclusively on the GameCube, with the possibility of ports to other consoles like PS2. But regarding its legacy, it seems like many people have come to appreciate Killer7 in recent years for how it cleverly puts a twist on everything you're used to in the genre, therefore making it one of the most unique games ever. Damn. For me, just from hearing all the cool scenarios that may have been in the game, first from Nitrad and then a couple of friends of mine, I've developed a fond interest of it, but I could never seem to get around to actually playing it, until now. So let's get to it. I'm playing the Steam version of this game, and actually with my copy, I was gifted it to me on Christmas last year by a close friend. I just want to take the time to really thank him for that. I appreciate it so much. Shoutouts to Daddy Man Thick Boy. I know it's taken a while to get on with it, but it's literally one of the main driving factors of me wanting to play, so you're the best. Thank you so much. So yeah, this is probably not going to be like my other reviews. Killer7, I already know this game won't resemble anything close to those light-hearted obscure Nintendo-like stuff I usually talk about. I think this time, it's going to be much darker, but also much weirder, and I'm really excited for that, so let's finally get to it. Right off the bat, that is a cool ass way to start the game. So the first thing you'll probably notice when starting up Killer7 and seeing this intro cutscene is probably the art style. Man, it cannot be understated at this point. The colors and gradients and cell shading, it all looks so cool. But I'll talk about it more in depth at a later point, I promise. So we see a man named Garcian Smith walking down a road until... This happens. Oh, that's Christopher Mills, alright. Interestingly enough, this intro cutscene mainly serves to just put you in the first level rather than introducing any of the complex, overarching plot, if that makes any sense. Which is actually a plus for me, getting right to the game just like that. Let's talk about the gameplay itself. Man. It's definitely something I've never seen anywhere else, from the controls and movement to the intricacies of the combat, there's really nothing out there like it, which I'm probably going to be saying a lot. This game is a shooter, but it's really more than just a shooter. The movement itself is on rails, which is a really interesting decision, but I feel like it actually works for what Killer7 is trying to do, if that makes any sense. Like, it's the level design that mostly does a good job at abiding by those rules, while also introducing some dynamic camera angles you wouldn't get otherwise. And it actually all does work, I'm not gonna lie. 
die. That's where the combat itself comes into play, where you can trigger a separate first person view and take aim and shoot at enemies in your path. You'll usually have to refresh your screen to actually see them and deal damage. Interestingly enough, Killer7 doesn't have any ammo system, even though you have a reload animation, which I would assume they included so you had more incentive to preserve your shots for the enemies. These guys are called the Heaven Smiles, and they have really cool designs in my opinion. According to the lore of this game, they're basically supposed to be humans infected with viruses that turn them into the smiles, and man, something about them. They're just so creepy, unsettling, but really charming at the same time. It definitely fits in with how insane this game can truly get. It's the sounds they make especially, those little chuckles you hear to know that they're approaching you, and oh boy, when they get close... A big, violent, screaming laugh as they've lunged towards you and explode, it's so sick. But they're not just there to serve as a pure threat, some will also tend to amuse you. I absolutely love these guys, like, you shoot at them once and they're like, <laughs> They blast themselves into a wall for no reason. That's really good. The game will also differ the designs of these guys many times as you play, introducing new types of heaven smiles every couple rooms or so. There's some of these weird flying guys which are almost impossible to shoot at and blind your field of vision, and these giant looming branches with tons of weak spots. These will infinitely spawn these egg roller heaven smiles until you completely eradicate it all. And speaking of weak spots, yeah, that's another thing the game definitely encourages you to do. Aim for the weak spots which are indicated by these weird swirly things on the Heaven Smiles. You want to shoot at them because you get blood for them, and simply put, blood is good in this game. Yeah, there's two types, thick and thin blood. Essentially, thick blood is used to convert to serums to upgrade character stats like unlocking special counterattacks, and thin blood is used for healing, simplest way I can put it. And oh man, the animation that plays when you nail their weak spots? Holy shit, could not be any cooler. Every time you shoot at them, it's like boom, all their blood droplets separate and spread out. It's so snappy and it's unbelievably satisfying. I mean, this is like one of the coolest thing I've seen in like anything, dude. The sound effects that accompany it too, like boom, 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 it just never gets old. Fuck you. This is just so good. Such a smart design decision too. For actually being able to shoot at their weak spots, your reward is extremely good eye candy for the death animations. Even if you don't nail the weak spots, you're still treated to a pretty badass animation. Blood gushing out of every crevice like a waterfall. It's fucking sick as hell. You're probably gonna notice with the footage I'm showing you, Killer7 likes to make lots of things just look kind of cool and stylish. You know, not just these environments and their art style, but also simple things, like the choices that pop up whenever you arrive at a junction. It always looks sick, even if these typically user-friendly things may seem daunting the first time you play. In actuality, the combat is relatively simple to get good at, and it does feel fun to plow down enemies in quick succession down your path. Knowing that you've mastered the mechanics, it really does pay off. I always love this feeling. It's the same feeling I get when playing a lot of the obscure games I talk about on this channel, and it's always rewarding in the best way possible. And here I was thinking that it'd be difficult to explain the gameplay of Killer7, but not really. So of course, this game is actually absolutely insane when you get down to it. It's gonna get more complex from here on out. Of course, we gotta talk about the characters you actually play as. Meet the Killer7. They're a group of seven deadly assassins who all go by the last name Smith, and they've been hired to kill specific people for specific reasons in each of the chapters you go through. They're all led by a frail old man in a wheelchair named Harmon Smith, who, while not looking the part, is actually one of the top-rated and most deadly assassins in the US. You seriously 
you don't want to mess with him. While you can't choose to play as him in regular gameplay, he does serve a huge story purpose, which we'll get to much later. The rest of the Killer7, however, do have very different personalities, but in terms of gameplay, they also have different special abilities and weapons that make them truly stand out. Kaidi Smith has a gun you can actually zoom in with, Kevin Smith doesn't use guns and instead throws knives, that's actually sick as hell. And then there's the wrestler guy of the bunch, Mask D. Smith, who can suplex enemies into the ground, Jesus Christ. It's kind of funny how that idea always stems to other games Suda51 has worked on, huh. The way you just switch characters too is also pretty neat, nothing like I've ever seen before too. In every save room you come across known as Harmon's Room, you do it with a television, and okay, okay, I just had to say it, but every time I see the screen, all I can think of is just FNAF. Like you put characters motionless on a TV, I'm just gonna think FNAF. I'm sorry, but that's just how it is. Okay. I mean, you even wake them up every time you start a new chapter and kill enough smiles. Wow. In general, each of the characters play in very different ways, either in speed, attack, or whatever. And I really do think they did a fantastic job at making them all feel unique in some way. Throughout my playthrough, I always went for Con Smith. I don't know, I think it's not only that I really like his design for some reason, but also that he's very fast on foot, and he can unlock the ability to auto-lock on weak spots making the combat an absolute breeze near the end. That's another thing I want to comment on, the Killer7's designs. I really love all of them, actually. I especially love the two suit wearers of the group, Dan Smith and Garcian Smith. While Dan is pretty aggressive with it, because it makes sense, Garcian dons a classy white suit and suitcase, because he actually isn't best used for combat. He deals really low damage to enemies, so instead, you're going to be using him to pick up the bags of blood left behind by other characters you died as. He does say he's a cleaner, after all. Don't make me say it again. Again, I'm a cleaner. Uh, okay, well, I guess that leads me to the respawn system of the game. Probably one of, if not my biggest gripes with this entire game. Yeah, I don't like what happens when you die, even if it's really unique and different. It's just a long process. Here's what happens. So first, you die then have to sit through a sort of lengthy death animation. Once that's done, you select a Garcian Smith and backtrack all the way to where you died. Which, mind you, if the last save room is far away, then that means more walking back which ends up being more tedious. So you grab the bag of blood and then revitalize the character, pretty interesting, and then, and only then, can you walk all the way to near where you died so you can resume your progress. To me, it's less so frustrating than just unnecessary. I really don't see a point in why dying and coming back has to take this many steps. It may seem faster than you think, but you will die at least a few times on your first playthrough, so the issue has to be brought up. Once again though, it is a really interesting and different process for sure, including that death animation especially. I will admit, it looks pretty awesome the first time you see it. Ashley probably won't meet your demise very often at all while playing, and that's because Killer7 is an easy game. I wasn't expecting it to be an easy game, but it really does make a lot of sense. Come to think of it, you can even make an argument of saying the combat itself is a case of style over substance. I wouldn't go that far. However, while it's fun to master in the early hours, the game is really easy and it does get repetitive, especially later on. Even if the characters have different ways of playing, I don't know, it's just not enough variety to make up for the bare bones combat. The enemy design also doesn't really get much variety either. I know I said they differ the designs in terms of how they look, how they act and how you have to deal with them seems to always be the same. Just shoot at their weak spots, except they kind of run differently or you have to hit them two more times or something like that. They really don't experiment much further. I guess the lack of variety and therefore lack of challenge in the game kind of makes sense 
sense with the team's mindset while they were creating this. They specifically wanted to make Killer7 accessible for everyone in terms of gameplay, which is a really good thing. The problem is that the game always remains this kind of mindset for the entire ride. It's always really no challenge. Occasionally though, I found the game to spike in frustration. I wouldn't say difficulty, there were just a few moments where I felt swarmed by enemies on both sides, and I couldn't do anything to recover, which led me to my death. Which, yeah, knowing that I had to deal with the respawn system I talked about earlier, that multiplied my frustration too. It was moments like these that I just wish I wasn't restricted to one measly plane of movement. I just wish I had more freedom in that regard. Again, it didn't happen often at all, but you know, I guess it's just a nitpick. But actually, that does bring up another point. When talking about the on-rails control scheme, it kind of removes a huge spectrum of challenge from the game. What I mean is that the game is either too easy or tends to spike in unfairness. And that made me realize, if I weren't restricted to two-dimensional movement in these wide-open spaces, which yes, the game puts you through sometimes, then that extent where the difficulty could change could open up more, and it would possibly be a different story thus actually opening up more room for enemy variety and stuff like that, if you catch my drift. Man, the combat itself is really interesting to talk about, potential-wise. It makes me really think they could have made a sequel to this game just based on that. But unfortunately, it seems extremely unlikely. Oh well. Overall, the combat itself is pretty decent, even if it's kind of polarizing when it comes to how easy and repetitive it can be. It's flawed, but man, it's just all about how purely satisfying shooting down the smiles is. That animation, man, it's just... Ah, that part never gets old. This is too easy. It seemed like I rambled a bit there, but let's finally move on to where Killer7 truly shines. That's right, the art style, the one thing everyone knows this game best for. It is so clean! I absolutely adore how this game looks, just from an artistic standpoint. The super harsh shadows and characters with the cell shading, the moody gradients of some of these areas, it all just fits in and blends perfectly, you know? I feel like this is the one thing really carrying that creepy atmosphere killer Seven's going for, combined with how much insane shit happens in this game. Like, okay, holy shit, this game gets really, really weird sometimes. I think having this kind of art style really adds to that. There's also something about it that seems so 6th gen, you know, with that awkward ass mo-capping too. Well, it's actually not that bad. It seems like a game that was specifically made with GameCube and PS2 hardware in mind. You know, we really need more games like this nowadays. It seems like big name companies are way more keen on making something look graphically impressive and realistic and blah blah blah. But literally this game, this art style right here, just proves the opposite. This is why I always think having a super unique art style is a lot better than just having a realistic one, because then it won't blend in with the crowd. You gotta have something that makes your game stand out. The art style of this game and the atmosphere also really serve to complement the overall personality of this game. I mean, I don't know how I would even describe the charm and the underlying humor of Killer7 in just a couple words. I mean, I guess it's not only just kinda edgy, but also rather silly to some extent. I don't know, this game has a bunch of memorable lines and quotes it seems. And man, I eventually did come to just absolutely love it all. Down to just goofy character interactions and dialogue and story cutscenes. What were you doing here? You're cleaning up. That's the Killer 7. Trying to die in style? Give me a break, you sick old man. And of course, you know, the famous, the one and only. No. Oh. <laughs> There's always time for fun. It's Friday night. Let's dance. Alright, this game is fucking insane.
Take it from me, I've played a couple of those obscure 6th gen games in my lifetime, but nothing has even come close to the unmatched bizarre nature of this one. It's definitely obvious it's a very suda heavy game, with everything presentation-wise, from the loading screen being a creepy pulsating moon to the menu UI, to those clean death animations too. I mean, there's truly no way to go over it all, it would take me hours to sum it all up. I even love just the little things like the TV quotes. Later. Peace. I've changed my makeup. Did you notice? Or how every member mutters an epic catchphrase when they nail a weak spot on a heaven smile. Hurts, doesn't it? You're fucked, you son of a bitch. <laughs> this is too easy. It's so edgy, but so cool. Yeah, they say the F word in this game a lot, but that's just a come and go with Suda51 stuff, so, you know. I also gotta mention the soundtrack real quick. It's pretty special. It has a lot of different sounding songs, but there's a lot of notable ones that I especially like for just being catchy and atmospheric. The composer for this game, Masafumi Takeda, is actually a fairly well-known composer for not only other Suda games, but also for games games like Danganronpa. Ah! Yeah, I was about to mention, but there's one song, just this one song in Killer7 that just sounds like a Danganronpa song, and, and, and it's this one. Dude, I knew it. Same composers. It makes total sense, actually. I mean, say what you will about Danganronpa in general, but those games have some good-ass music. Let's talk about the structure for a sec. Killer7 is split into chapters where you'll usually explore a level and progress the story, usually near the end of that chapter. The way you commence every single one of them is wicked cool too, blasting the target like you would with any ordinary heaven smile. Just always an amazing way to start one of these things. With the first level you go through, it might seem a little underwhelming in terms of design. I mean, the first chapter just has you going through a series of linear hallways, but it does pick up its pace with the later surroundings. You eventually explore areas like a Japanese-styled restaurant with a moody nighttime theme, a colorful amusement park, and a town in the Dominican Republic which looks really cool. In these areas, you'll be dealing with the aforementioned enemies in combat while also solving a multitude of puzzles, which are kind of nothing in my opinion. Again, it does make sense knowing that the team wanted to make this game accessible, but they're ridiculously easy to figure out. They take no thought process whatsoever. Most of them are usually just like, do a thing that does another thing, or use a specific item or character at the right place. With those ones, each of the members of the Killer7 also have special abilities which you can trigger at the press of a button, like breaking a barrier or jumping to great heights. The problem with those ones, though, is that the game, I kid you not literally spoils you on what item or character to use at that place. Look at this map, it's literally spoiling the answer every single time. So there's really no puzzle here, pretty sad. I will at least give the team some credit, they had the decency to give you the ability to switch characters on the fly, I mean really dodged a bullet with backtracking and whatnot, good stuff at least. Still on top of that, the game loves to give you hints regardless, it's this guy right here, Yoon Hyun. Talking to him will have him already tell you something obvious about the solution to the puzzle, but then he gives you the opportunity to actually pay blood for another hint, as if you didn't understand the puzzle at face value. Like, it's at that point, why would anyone want to even do that? That's disappointing, but hey, he at least gets it. I mean, he double middle fingers you for doing that. Man, I love the humor of this game. I will admit, the puzzle scenarios themselves are pretty absurd. They're usually like complete nonsense that causes other complete nonsense to happen. 
One of the first puzzles you solve involves turning on a sprinkler with a water ring, flushing a toilet, and getting an item in a completely separate room. Shit like that where it doesn't make any sense at all is pretty hilarious, honestly. I especially really love the puzzles that also pose some kind of quiz to you, but it always asks the stupidest and most specific questions you can think of, just based on memory. Like, what color is the guy's shirt in this poster, or how many people are in this poster? It's pretty good. Overall, in general, the structure of these areas kind of stands on its own in Killer7. I suppose you could say they're similar to the progressive nature of... Metroid in one or two cases, but yeah, they're nothing alike actually. Scratch that. Throughout your journey, you'll come across some of the repeating characters, like Iwazaru, a mysterious man in a bondage suit who's basically your main tips and tricks guy, Yoon Hyun, the hint guy, and Travis! No, not that Travis. Those are two separate games. <laughs> this guy is the cooler Travis, actually. I love him for some reason. His shirt always says something different every time, and he actually serves to deliver more backstory to the chapter you're in. I bring up these guys because that leads me more specifically to the writing of this game. Man, it is just weird as hell. When it comes to the repeating NPCs, their dialogue may be totally incomprehensible at first, but it's at some point that you do sort of come to understand it in some way. Except for this decapitated head, Susie. She's actually a really interesting character with a rather dark backstory, which I won't spoil. Most of her dialogue did come off as nonsense to me for most of the time, though. It's like every time you talk to her, you better be down to expect a paragraph of meaningless text, right? But not exactly. Again, at some point, I do like to think it does have some meaning in there. Something I can't really decipher, but a meaning nonetheless. And that's why I always found hearing what these people had to say oddly pleasing. Strange how it works, right? I think it's even cooler when you realize that these people are technically dead, which explains why most of them look like ghosts and why they have otherworldly sounding voices. It's another part of this game that really serves to complete the eerie yet comforting atmosphere. Combined with these people you meet and the bizarre puzzles, I'll just say this, I know it's gonna sound like a complete stretch, but this kind of stuff really gave me a lot of chibi robo vibes if that makes any sense, it probably doesn't. But in that game you also had a lot of strange scenarios you could explore, weird things happening, but most importantly, those wacky characters you could talk to. Alongside that, Chiba Robo also had a lot of pleasant audio cues and jingles, just like Killer7 whenever you successfully complete a puzzle. I don't know, I just really get a sense of that here in this game if that's logical. I should review that game sometime, but that's for another day. So, you've probably gotten the impression, hopefully at this point, that Killer7 is a very different game. I want to take the time at this part of the video to say, please play it. Killer7 has a boatload of absurdities tucked in there, its areas, its characters, and how the game puts twists on a bunch of just gameplay mechanics alone. It's just brimming with that classic Suda51 style many people have come to know and love. I've tried my best to talk about it all while keeping most of it, if not all of the mystery surrounding the characters and the plot, intact. Because, oh man, when I say I'm only scratching the surface, I totally mean it. I have not gone in depth on some of the absolute insanity this game pulls from under the rug. I mean, trust me, people are not lying when they say that it gets really, really, really weird. And I think instead of just trying to explain and decrypt the deep symbolism and meaning of it all, I just want to talk about it, not craft my own fan theories. That's going to be what I dedicate the rest of this video to doing. As for now, I'm going to put a pretty hefty spoiler warning. The strange scenarios I'm about to discuss, they are absolutely best enjoyed blind. Please don't go further if you haven't touched this game. I already encourage you to just try it out, see if you dig it. But if you're okay with this, then let's move on. 
Alright, so once again, let me reiterate. Killer7 is an extremely strange game sometimes. The only way I can really think I can structure this section is if I just go chapter by chapter. Starting with Target Zero, Angel. Yeah, that will never get old. So this is the tutorial chapter of the game, and not a lot of interesting stuff happens honestly until near the end of the chapter, which is a trend you'll see every time. The start and end of these sections will always have some kind of narrative present in some way. You'll know you're at that end point when the game lets you pass through the vinculum gate as they call it. You need enough of these things called soul shells to pass through though, which are obtained by solving the numerous puzzles present in the area. Structure goes like this, you find a mini boss in the form of a new heaven smile, progress the story in some way, and then catch a break back at Garcian's trailer house in the suburbs of Seattle, where you can then encounter another possible interaction with Harmon Smith himself, and then start the next chapter by catching another job from Christopher Mills at the Overpass. At the trailer house, you can get some really interesting cutscenes to play out, specifically between Harmon Smith himself and Samantha, who seems to physically and mentally torment him for some reason. Feel good. Talk about relieving stress. I couldn't explain what this even means, even if I knew why she does this constantly. So it's another one of those things Killer7 throws at you that may not make sense at all, but will end up having meaning later on, I guess? I do know there's a theme of different sides or whatever. It's like a yin-yang kind of thing. One side of Samantha is actually kind and respectful to Harmon when he's awake, the other side is the complete opposite when he's asleep. Except for that one scene where- uh, OH MY GOD! Uh, <laughs> and then we got peculiar screaming. What you hear beyond the door is at the end of the hallway in Garcian's house too. Will also probably confuse you endlessly for the whole ride. I mean just listen, something's gotta be going down over there. Going back to the chapters now, near the end of Target Zero specifically, we get our first introduction to Kun Lan, the main villain of Killer7. In this cutscene, we can best assume that Harmon Smith and Kun Lan seem to have an endless rivalry of sorts, but it's one of friendly bitterness if that makes any sense. They talk to each other in a very civil way, and the game mainly wants you to focus on the never-ending game of chess aspect to the relationship. And I mean game of chess literally too, they play chest in this scene, so... This is where, once again, the writing of the game truly shows itself. Because you're a bad player. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, the story of Killer7 is a complex one to say the least, and it doesn't exactly help that it isn't told in the most clear way you'll come to find. As such, tons of the plot is open to your own interpretation. We'll surely get to that in due time, however. Target 1 Sunset is a bit more interesting, where you explore the restaurant owned by Fukushima in part 1, and at the end, face off against this lady in a timed shootout. It's epic, it's fiery, holy shit! You then arrive at a building where you engage in one of the strangest boss fights I've ever seen. Two headless grotesque businessmen shooting giant balls of poop at you. What the hell does it even mean? I have no idea, but again, it probably has some hidden message buried deep in there. Another one of those things Killer7 likes to just show you and move on with. That takes me to Target 2 Cloud Man. Ah, <sighs> probably the most memorable yet weirdest area in the entire game. Saying weird is like an understatement too. Alright, let me just show you. This is how the chapter opens up. Oh, oh my god, I can't hold back. Oh, oh god, oh, I'm coming. Oh, oh, yeah! See, I told you, this is real. Yeah, so meet Andre Almeida, a man with a plan, he says, and that plan? To make the perfect ideal city in Texas. This chapter takes place in that very city, and it possibly has some of the most fever dream-esque things you'll ever come across, 
in your life. You'll meet several unknown characters in these special animated cutscenes. I gotta say, I really don't like how they're animated at all. It's so creepy. It's kind of like an anime art style, I guess, but it also has some heavy motion tweening, making you extremely uncomfortable for the entire ride. Something about the way it's drawn too is just so jarring and surreal. I don't know how to describe it other than that. But it definitely makes this entire area have an almost otherworldly vibe, even if it's kind of funny how ridiculous the entire chapter's concept is. Andre Almeida especially, he's such a weird narcissist, I don't know, for some reason you can collect a dozen different bottle cap figures of him, like what? And there's like a bunch of these stupid Almeida smiles running around, not hurting you? pretty funny. The main focus of the chapter in terms of storyline is that Andre Almeida owns this corporation called First Life, but it turns out to be a huge fraud. That's pretty hilarious. And uh, yeah, the ending to this target too, man, it is like, I, I don't even know how to talk about it. It's probably one of the most insane things I've ever experienced in any form of media. And I'm not even fucking kidding when I say that. Okay, so how do I go about this? So after the whole corporate building falls flat like a giant piece of cardboard, we meet Almeida in a car or truck vehicle where he then explains how his company, First Life, is merely a giant sham. It's only something that runs commercials, and that's the whole point. But our corporation, First Life Inc., <laughs> It doesn't exist, no sir. It just runs commercials. He then introduces us to his followers. With one particular follower, he forces him to do something that could deem fatal. Drive a car at unimaginable speeds and just see if he survives, because why the fuck not? Afterwards, the US military arrives at the scene, yeah, and well, let's just play this out. <laughs> so, as we can see, Andre Almeida has turned into a weird, giant, creepy, and gross heaven smile with tentacles, and now we have to fight him in a series of never ending ambulance trucks. Oh my god, what the actual hell? And then what plays out after that? Okay, the cherry on top of all of this madness. I won't even explain it. Just fucking take a look. Clements, you're in control of things now. Walk down the path of life. Don't succumb to weakness. Take the big risks. This game is a trip. Like, this game is fucking insane, alright? This chapter is fucking bonkers. It is one of those times, one of those rare times in a video game where I feel like I'm playing a completely different video game. I mean, that's impressive. Considering that Killer7 on its own is already batshit crazy. I mean, but this chapter, holy shit, it's just... What? So, what does it all mean? It has to mean something, right? Everything that's occurred, especially near the end of the chapter. Could it be a message about how every company in the world is just a fraud? Just like Almeida's perfect city and his own corporation? Is it about destiny? Free will? Something along those lines? Honestly, I have no clue at all. And I think that's awesome. I think this is one of those moments in Killer7 where it's best to just watch it all unfold instead of actually trying to understand it all. Hell, let alone even explain it. A trend that remains true for a lot of this game's complex and profound plot. But you do slowly start to realize all of it is deliberate at delivering some kind of dark message and theme. And it's at that point... Suda51 is a fucking mastermind. I don't even know what to make of this chapter at all. Andre Almeida is an almighty god for all we know. Jesus. <sighs> what a thing. I'll be right back. I need a shower. Alright, target three, encounter. Probably one of the darkest scenarios you'll explore. Uh, 
as if the previous one wasn't also dark as hell. My god. The first part of this chapter is actually set in a really cool environment where you're exploring a full-on amusement park. One of my favorite parts of the series is where you actually get to head inside one of those uh, circus tents and you play a bunch of carnival games and stuff like that. It's pretty fun. The second part is actually where the game takes the time to focus on one of the members in Killer7, Dan Smith to be exact. In this chapter, our main goal actually involves seeking a man named Curtis Blackburn, probably one of the most villainous characters you'll come across, as he literally kills girls for organ trafficking and lets their fathers see their severed heads before they die. I mean, Jesus fucking Christ! Alongside that, we also get to learn more about the backstory of Dan Smith and specifically his relationship with Blackburn. It's pretty interesting, and I honestly wish the team took more time to explore the backstory of more of the characters you play as, because this is like the only time it really happens. Suda51 actually stated that about two thirds of the story was cut out, which is a lot, so that definitely explains it. Still, it is really sad, and it's surely something I wish we could have seen likewise. Back to Target 3 though, I really like the exploration aspect of this chapter especially, specifically with the Blackburn residence. It's that music, man. Ah, it's so relaxing and chill. This is one of those times where I just have to say, you gotta hear the music of a video game for yourself. Just listen. So at this point, I also want to take a quick moment to mention the boss fights of this chapter. You face off against two iterations of this, uh, anime girl named Ayame who has a machine gun. Again, just roll with it, Killer7 always does weird shit like this. The reason I bring up the topic of boss fights is because that's unfortunately another disappointment I have with this game. While pretty much every boss switches things up in some new way, they're almost always an absolute joke to defeat. It's like every time you come across them, it's just like, okay, this is a cool idea for a fight, and then boom, it's just over in one or two hits. It never lasts for long. That's the case with the Almeida fight, the Headless Businessmen fight, and mostly other narrative-based bosses like that. It's really sad when it happens though, even if it's for story reasons or whatever. The only one I was actually really surprised with was the second version of the anime girl boss battle in the Blackburn residence. I mean, wow, she actually posed some kind of threat, and more importantly lasted for more than two seconds? Like, I was shocked! The fight was still easy, but, you know, I was still presently surprised. Although her machine gun is really loud though, like, oh my god, it's fucking blaring, man! Again, even if the bosses don't pose any real challenge, well, they always have some cool gimmick, like I said. The fight with Almeida is at least a pretty cool concept. You have to carefully yet quickly navigate through this big maze of ambulance trucks while you have no clue where the boss is at any time. It's surprisingly pretty intense, but again, it all ends in literally one shot. However, the one-on-one -on -one duel between Dan Smith and Curtis Blackburn at the end of Chapter 3 is pretty cool, I gotta admit. It's entirely dependent on reflexes and patience. Waiting for the bird to fly off his shoulder, that's when you know you gotta aim and shoot. It's actually a really tense standoff, yet it's a fitting send-off for a despicable character like him, too. I love it. So after ending that chapter off, we move on to Alter Ego Target 4, the second to last chapter of the game. This one is set in the Dominican Republic, in a resort town of sorts, which I did mention earlier for just looking cool in general. For the entire game up to this point, you've been stuck in these moody and dark areas for the whole campaign, so having this bright and cheery town to explore was definitely a nice change of pace. Your main target this time, or targets should I say, are the handsome men who are clear parodies of the Power Rangers. To fit in with this parody, this chapter mostly has anime FMVs for its cutscenes, which is a good-ass touch. And plus, the ending to this one is pretty humorous. The boss fight that takes place is styled after something like an arcade fighting game, one member of one side against another member of the other side, but the handsome men actually behave in the exact same ways as the members of Killer7. It ends with these cute little retro-themed credits too, it's pretty neat. Even if the fights are predetermined, 
and again, not hard at all. It's actually a pretty charming and lighthearted chapter. I do like it. Oh, and that takes us to the finale. Alright, before we get to talking about this section, I just have to say it. If you have gotten this far into the video and you still haven't played Killer7 for whatever reason, first of all, what are you doing? And second of all, I'm just telling you, it is really worth your time to not watch this next section. Because I don't want to spoil the rest of the story for you if you haven't played it. I really don't. Again, Killer7 is an experience worth trying out for all the batshit insane stuff it does. But now we're really getting into spoiling the overarching plot, which by the way has some pretty cool twists. So yeah, you okay with that? Then alright. Target 5, smile. Fitting for a finale to Killer7, Target 5 seems to really focus on the backstory of several major characters in the game. Specifically Kun Lan, Harmon Smith, Garcian Smith specifically, and the entire Killer7 group of course. And it is really interesting actually how it all unfolds. Before I get to talking about the final chapter, I first want to go over what we know about the Killer7 group itself at this point. So I forgot to mention this, but occasionally through your adventure in the levels you explore, you'll find carrier pigeons that'll hand out notes to you, which also clues you in on details mostly regarding the mystery of the group Killer7, specifically who they really are, why they all never seem to interact with each other, and just overall trying to uncover the mystery of them. One of these notes does confirm a major suspicion, the fact that every member is actually dead. This comes with a perplexing explanation for how you're even able to play as them. Apparently Harmon Smith, as they all died, inherited all their identities in some way, and was now somehow able to switch to them via the ease of a television. According to Wikipedia at least, this condition Harmon exhibits is known as Multifoliate Personae Phenomenon, and I gotta be honest, this is such a cool concept to me. Killer7's story and characters are shrouded in total mystery, which even extends to the NPCs, so to get this kind of insight on them and have it be unveiled in a twist like this, it's really fascinating to me. So hopefully that clears up some things, because you'll find that the final chapter is gonna expand on this part of the narrative, while also focusing on Garcian Smith. Before, Garcian Smith didn't play much of a role at all in the game, he mostly starred in cutscenes, especially between chapters. But now in the final part, you'll find that this priority shifts a bit, and you'll soon realize he's probably the most important character in the entire game. So let's get to it. So, here's how Target 5 starts out. What do you even want me to say about this? Okay. At Garcian's trailer house, upon finding out that Samantha is now dead all of a sudden with no reason, you're now able to finally enter the mysterious forbidden room, where you were constantly hearing all the hysterical screaming coming from that same room throughout the game. It's time to finally see what's on the other side. Kun Lan and Harmon are seen playing chess. After both react strongly and eccentrically to Garcin's presence, <laughs> he simply leaves. Garcia and Christopher Mills then have their usual conversation on the overpass until. <laughs> no, he died! Oh, man, this is bad. It's so bad that it makes Garcia Smith ride on a freaking truck. That's sick. We then move on to the actual level portion. The first section of Target 5 is nothing all that special. You just explore a regular old hotel with not much inside and then you're just done like that. But this obviously serves as some heavy foreshadowing, hoo hoo, we'll get to it later. The second area is probably one of the best in the game for sure, this time being in elementary school. And I really do enjoy this part of the game because it's actually the one area, the one area where they do get kind of clever with the puzzles. Okay, well, it's still nothing that special, but it's at least something not insultingly easy to figure out. It's now not just a case of do this so this happens. 
open world with still plenty of that, but there's also purely environmental based puzzles with no hints present, involving you shooting specific lockers from a series of numbers you have to read elsewhere to find multiple items. Throughout the school, you'll pick up more and more tapes, all recorded by someone called Holbert. This is where you learn tons of new information about an ultra-mysterious man by the name of Amir Parkreiner, including his date and place of birth, his mother and father's name, and even backstory in him and what the school was actually meant for. Turns out, Coburn Elementary School was a device used by the government to train future assassins, aka the little kids attending the school. It gets dark real fast and really odd too. Apparently this Amir person had a scarring and traumatic childhood at this school, leaving him with murderous intent early on in his life. So with that info stuck in your mind, you eventually arrive at the principal's office. And this is where you get to witness one of the coolest cutscenes in the game in my opinion. Benjamin, the principal, and Garcine Smith engage in a game of Russian roulette. But much to Ben's demise, the gun has seven bullets not six, and it's actually a weirdly intense cutscene to sit through, combined with the escalating music as well. <laughs> Now, this is where the game gets really strange. Everything you've done in every chapter, it may as well have led up to this very point. Entering the gymnasium of the school shows the corpse of a large, suited, hanging man from the ceiling. You're now forced to engage in a fight with the swinging corpse. After shooting him enough times to remove his pants, and then grotesquely blasting his bottom half, seven black heaven smiles appear on the stage. A golden gun drops to the floor, but in an attempt to pick it up, the game will respond with the fact that whoever you're playing as can't handle this. With every single black smile, you're forced to die as every member of Killer7. No way of retreating, no way of fighting back, and no way of wielding the golden gun. It's pretty hopeless. It's now up to Garcian Smith to actually hold the golden gun in hand and kill the last black smile. After this, Garcian returns to the Union Hotel just like at the very start of the chapter, except now, he's witnessing the moments of everyone's death, everyone part of the Killer7. This is how they all died. Now, what I find most interesting about this sequence is that the method in which everyone died seems to mirror how they act when a part of the Killer7. For example, Masked Day Smith died while naked in a shower, which reflects how he completely covers up his skin for his persona. Kevin Smith dies while pearly disguising as the hotel clerk. To combat this, he gains the ability to go fully invisible for total camouflage. It's just stuff like this that serves as really cool attention to detail, honestly. After all of this, the game puts a pretty major twist on you at the very last second. So it turns out this Amir Parkreiner is actually Garcian Smith himself, and that he was the one who killed the Killer7 many years ago. He's told this unforgivable truth by a young Harmon Smith. Garcian then witnesses Kun Lan and Harmon playing chess again in the same forbidden room like last time, except now... He repeatedly sticks bullets into each of their bodies. At the roof of the hotel, he meets his former identity, a version of Amir Parkreiner with three eyes. And honestly, I think it's best if I just play the scene. No, it wasn't me. It, it can't be. It, it's all a misunderstanding. That's credits. So, you probably have a million questions at this point, uh, probably one of them being, 
What does it all mean? What could a mere shooting himself symbolize? What could that fight with the corpse hanging from the ceiling in the gym convey? And of course, the black heaven smiles. Well, fear not, because I have an answer to all of these questions. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, at all. I don't know what all of it could even mean, so yeah. But I will at least say this. Everything that plays out seems so specifically designed in such a way that all of it must have some kind of deep and profound message hidden in the boss fights, and the narrative choices of including specific versions of characters, and the symbolic actions of Emir Park Rider. It's hidden somewhere. I just don't know what that message is. All I do know is that this final chapter, Target 5, seems to have a theme of digging up lost memories or something like that. That. There's a reason the game makes you trudge through the hotel for the first time, and that's because it wants to enforce the idea that you're exploring an extremely crucial area to you and your life, and you do know something important went down here, but you don't know what happened here, if that makes sense. The way it's all written is genius, I won't lie. Again, I said this regarding the story of this game, but I just wanted to talk about it all, because it's all still extremely interesting to me. I didn't want to craft my own theories about what it's all supposed to be, but still, that's not even the end of it. There's one more chapter, Target 6 Lion, which is essentially the epilogue. Three years later, we arrive at Battleship Island in Japan as a new form of a mere park rider, not Garcian. After exploring a bit, we meet with Kenjiro Matsuoka, who gives you a fatal choice of whether to kill him or let him go. No matter your choice, you're able to proceed beyond the door and fight what's said to be the last remaining smile on Earth. You first stumble upon a dead Harmon lying on the floor for some unknown reason, then proceed to run around a long, twisting and turning hallway to find Iwazaru, where you're forced to kill him when he's cornered. Interestingly enough, it turns out that Iwazaru was Kunlan the entire time. Of course, we could be misled by this little giveaway, so who really knows. After this, in an animated cutscene, depending on what choice you made with Matsuoka, the battleship island will either explode from a missile attack or won't, and Japan will plan to take revenge on the US. So your choice basically decides either of the two results, the US winning or Japan winning. Regardless of your choice, after the credits, the following final cutscene will play out, 100 years later. This scene harkens back to Harmon and Kunlan's very first interactions you see in the game, but now this time, the cutscene represents how their fighting will seemingly go on forever, till the end of time. from your nightmare. Harmon, the world won't change. All it does is turn. Now, let's dance. <laughs> <laughs> A game. Oh, Jesus, I think I'd need another shower. So in conclusion, what do I think of Killer 7's story? I honestly don't really know. It's just one of those things where I have an extremely difficult time trying to process my thoughts on it, and that's because I don't really understand a lot of the intricate details of the plot, but I will say there's tons of aspects about it that seem so carefully crafted, so deliberate in its symbolism, especially near the end. That fight in the gym is a perfect example of that. While I can't find the meaning of it, I can at least say it's incredibly cleverly thought out. My favorite parts were the parts which I actually understood. I thought that twist with Garcia and Smith especially, it's really interesting. And the realization that hits you and him at the end of the same time? Ah, it's actually so good. I mean the voice acting too, really tying it all together. But once it was over? Well, it was weird. I kinda felt... 
empty? I mean, it's really strange, because I kinda absolutely love this narrative, even if I don't understand it at all. So when I first saw those credits roll, I was like, oh man, it's over. I just wanted to see more of this game's utterly bizarre potential scenarios afterwards. It's like watching every single one of those cutscenes, getting to hear the dialogue. It's a damn fever dream. But weirdly enough, it's a fever dream that I never wanted to leave. And I think with Killer7 creating that feeling, that's really damn impressive. No other game could ever come close to the true complexity and confounding nature of literally everything that happens in the entire game. I've never played or experienced something that has left me with these kinds of opinions. And let me just reiterate, almost two-thirds of the story and lore was actually scrapped according to Suda51. And just knowing how this game came out to be already, I mean, can you imagine how much of a rabbit hole the plot will become if it was all kept in for the final product? This is why I want to leave the story section of this video just at that. I mean, I feel like I haven't talked about half of the game's weird story devices it throws at you. Heck, did I even mention there's a whole political side to it all? That's another thing the game wants you to know about. I mean, you could even say Killer7 is technically a commentary on politicians and worldwide conflicts. There's enough evidence to back it up. I mean, the only other game I know of that deals with those kinds of topics is Metal Gear Solid 2 for Christ's sake. And yes, I feel like Killer7 genuinely comes pretty close to the sheer insanity of that game's lore. Except Killer7 seems to be set in a vastly different version of our world, a unique 21st century, where people kill other people with huge gun blasts and tons of blood for seemingly no reason at all with the mindset of suffering no consequence. And they just go with it because that's how the world works or something. Okay, that's probably not the point this game is trying to make. Definitely not. But I think it's best to leave all of the story open to wide interpretation. And while at the moment I don't have any of my own theories I can throw in the mix, Ah, man, people have definitely tried to uncover the secrets of this game, the characters and metaphors and dark themes and all that stuff. It's really an interesting watch. So yeah, overall, Killer7's story may as well be amazing, it may as well be brilliant, but it may as well also be total nonsense, because in the end, who the fuck knows what it all means? I mean, an interpretation is just an interpretation at the end of the day. It's your own way of deciphering it. There's absolutely truly no wrong way to view the game's themes. And that is precisely why I absolutely adore Killer7. So yeah, Killer7 is probably the game ever made. It's such a departure from everything, and I mean everything you're used to in anything, in any form of media, movies, books, anything. It really is that unique. The game is brimming with personality from start to finish, with the art style, the animations, the character dialogue, and yes, the story, insane as ever. The gameplay, though, I thought was decent. 
Even while the puzzles were a complete joke, I mean, I think that gameplay loop alone has a boatload of potential. If it just had more variety in enemy design and maybe ditched the on-rails control scheme or settled for something in between, a sequel definitely could have been possible. Maybe something called, like, a uh, Killer 8? Actually, no. Funnily enough, that's actually the name of the New Game Plus mode you unlock after beating the game. And I kid you not, I legit thought it was an actual sequel you could play for a sec. Obviously not. At this point, it seems pretty much completely improbable a sequel will ever happen, knowing that Capcom technically owns the right. But even then, no matter the possibility of a sequel, I think it all really comes down to the narrative that got cut down immensely for the final game. I mean, once again, can you even imagine a version of the game with the full story intact? How insane would it be? Just look at the beta footage too. Killer7 used to look so much more different. These little trailers are really fascinating to me, and if anything, gives me a little taste of what the story looked like then. I think I could safely say that I really like this game just for the style alone, man. It definitely makes me want to check out some of Suda's other work if this is what I get a taste of. Like, no more years especially, goddamn. And overall, I think you should play the game, even if it's definitely not for everyone, just try it out at least. The Steam version is a fantastic port, and it's what I played for this video. It's only $20, which is not a bad price at all in my opinion. I think this is an excellent example of why we should get more high quality ports for obscure games like this. I mean, come on, we need super unique games like Killer7 to be more accessible to a general audience, right? Just re-releasing old games as remasters is something that every company should be doing. You can go for the original GameCube version, but in my time playing it, I found it much harder to actually gauge where the weak spots were on the smiles, most likely because of the lower resolution, which is interesting how that changes the difficulty a little bit. Anyways, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. I don't know why, but I'm pretty much incapable of making short videos at this point. I just have to live with it. Writing the script of this video was probably one of the most challenging things I ever had to do for this channel, by the way. I mean, it was really tough to convey my thoughts on Killer7 in a proper tone to justify the true insanity of this game. In general, though, I do want to cover more games like this, and mostly what I mean is just stuff that's not Nintendo for once. I've done enough of that already. Anyways, thanks for watching again. I really appreciate it. I'll see you again sometime soon. Bye.